I'm Mary Claire Hansen. We have a beautiful summer day. It's almost like San Diego today. So, if you lived in San Diego, we couldn't afford to live here. <laughs> so, um, please pay attention to our prayer list for this week for members and friends of the congregation. Also, continued issues with uh, Ukraine, COVID, and the unrest in this country. Um, very tragic what happened last Monday. Um, so we have a trustees meeting today following the service, immediately following the service. So if all the trustees would please, where the, where's everybody going to meet? Where's everyone meeting, Jim? You go in the living room, in the fellowship hall? Fellowship hall? Oh, in the uh, uh, children's room? Okay, they're going to meet in the children's room. Okay. Um, really not of a lot of uh, announcements for today. Um, we're still looking for people who would like to spend a little bit of time in the garden out there. Um, and uh, any weeding. Um, I did a little bit of planting this week. So if anybody has a spare 30 minutes or an hour um, and you need to let out some frustrations, please help yourself. Paula? If folks haven't noticed when you're driving down Broadway past the church, before you leave, Yeah, they are gorgeous. The hydrangeas are outstanding. The hydrangeas on the side of the church here are just colors. absolutely beautiful this year. It's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Next to the ramp, but yeah. Take a look around the corner. Yeah, they are beautiful. I saw them yesterday. Very nice. Uh, birthdays for this week. Tomorrow, Deb Clark and Joe Whalen. <laughs> Happy birthday, Joe. 29? That's what. <laughs> yeah, that's what they have in the calendar. Is that is that correct? Is it? I, I think so. Okay. <laughs> oh, but you're 28, not 29. I'm trying to cancel. <laughs> and Linda Whalen on the 14th. Yeah, two birthdays this week in your house. Happy birthday! And then the anniversary on the 15th, Dave and Maria Cherneski. Uh, we missed them. We haven't seen them in a while. So happy anniversary, Dave and Maria. So are there any other announcements for today? If not, let's please prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning. I welcome you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please rise and join with me in this morning's call to worship. We will read responsive. Let us look up and live. Let us come to let us come to celebrate. We are vehicles of the King of Kings. We represent him in all his saving power. We are his beloved servants in this world. Let us worship together and give God the glory. Our opening hymn is number 31, Holy is the Lord.
us pray. O oh God, grant that in our worship we may come very near to you. In all we do, give us grace to follow the leading of your Holy Spirit. You are our shield and shelter, our joy and hope, our strength and life, and our portion forevermore. Deepen our faith in you, enlighten our understanding, sanctify our wills, and let all our thoughts and deeds glorify you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, let us pause and join together in unison the prayer of confession, followed by a few moments of personal time of confession to our Lord. Let us pray. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess in your presence the sinfulness of our nature, our shortcomings and offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy, O Lord, upon us. We who are ashamed and sorry all we have done to displease you and forgive our sins, those which we speak aloud and those we confess in this silent time. at the beginning of this service of worship to recognize you as the sovereign Lord of the universe, but also our Heavenly Father. Thank you for this beautiful day and the beginning of a new week. As we begin this new week in faith, we thank you for your grace and your mercy that we experienced again this past week and for your forgiveness that's always available to us upon our confession of its need. And truly, we're needy individuals in that regard. So forgive us of every and all sin, sins of commission as well as omission. And we also ask for a refilling of your spirit, that we might live lives pleasing and honoring to you, encouraging and uplifting to our fellow man. And now we ask your blessing on this service for your honor and glory for the kingdom's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. our sin. Jesus taking our place and um, giving us forgiveness of sins and the assurance of eternal life. Another young man has entered the sanctuary. This is the boys' day today. <laughs> and uh, Lisa is away. So does that mean you're on today, Karen? Yes. You're on today, okay. Do you, <laughs> do you need some help? <laughs> you're helping. All right. Gene's helping. Very good. Well, we've Great to see the boys here today. Now, um, MC, you, you were relating about a blueberry pie. Wasn't it you that were relating? No, it was um, me, I think. Denise. It was Denise. Okay. Yes. Get, get the uh, microphone over to Denise. You got to hear this. You got to hear this. You got to hear this story about the blueberry pie and uh, what some young man had to say about it. Okay, well, I don't like to be on the microphone, but um, Jeremiah was with his friend AJ. Um, AJ's mom picked him up after a hockey practice, and he was going over AJ's house. So Jeremiah said to AJ, just out of conversation, why don't you come to church with us on Sunday? So AJ's mom was relating this story to Kyle, 
And A.J. said, okay. He said, um, do you go to St. Mary's? And he said, no. He said, do you go to um, St. Anne's? He said, no. Do you go to St. Gabriel's? He said, no. He said, well, I ran out of saints. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so then Jeremiah said, well, listen, we have a great lunch after, after church, and we have the best blueberry pie that there is. And Rebecca had made the blueberry pie. So... Um, so Karen was really nice enough to go out and get blueberry and apple pie for today. So, um, and AJ is here with the boys. So. All right. Well, that was great to get that recommendation of the church and the lunch and the blueberry pie. That was, that was an excellent blueberry pie last week. All right, you. All right, you. You're always going to get at least half of it because if we know where the half goes to. Uh, Paula's sister, so great. Uh, that was, Debbie said, that was a sneaky way to do that with the uh, blueberry pie and rhubarb, usually a strawberry. Yeah, and an excellent crust. My mother was a great pie baker, so I always judge pies based upon how they measure up to my mother's pies. And the uh, secret is into crust and a lot of it, absolutely. Uh, she used Crisco. I don't know about you, but uh, Crisco. Nice, light, and fluffy. So, um, as the summer goes by, we continue to collect funds for the uh, Christians and the ministries reaching out to Ukraine. Uh, another $267 here, uh, Paula, along with the $2,500 that we've sent so far. Um, I just saw an article the other day about uh, Mennonite Brethren. The Mennonite Brethren... There was a lot of Mennonites who were invited by Catherine the Great to settle and uh, turn Ukraine into the breadbasket that it became of Russia and Europe. And um, after a period of time, the Mennonites became like a lot of denominations, just kind of ritualistic and um, uh, lacking in fervor. And along came these Baptist evangelists and uh, started sharing the gospel and the word. And so the Mennonite brethren are kind of a combination of Mennonite and, and Baptist, but um, a good percentage of the Mennonite brethren that still exist in Russia are now in the area of the Ukraine that is under the Russian uh, occupation and war. And so we just pray for their protection. Uh, these, a lot of them have not left. They've stayed there with their farms and in their communities. And uh, so we just uh, pray for as you pray for Ukraine, pray for the Christians of all, all denominations. You have the Orthodox, you got the Baptists, you got the Mennonites, you got the Pentecostals. Uh, there are Christians of all denominations in Russia that, that are caught in the middle of a situation, horrible situation, as well as as uh, people of the Jewish faith, the president that is the Jewish, and et cetera. So uh, we continue to share through um, Samaritan's Purse, uh, relief work there as well as uh, other disasters and things that uh, occur uh, in this country. Uh, I think one of the reasons that God is blessing this church is because we're a missions-minded church. We're not just here to take care of ourselves and uh, build up our own friendship and fellowship, but we're here to also reach out with the life-changing message of the gospel to our community as well as around the world. So we ask God's blessing upon our offerings that indeed this church here since 1895, we'll continue being a beacon of light here on the western shore of Milford, but reaching out to our community, state, nation, and world. Mm -hmm.
Hey, very nice, very nice. Thank you, choir. Thank you. That was a great song. That actually, before I read, I must say, it took me back in time to a point where, when I was a seeking sinner, I was in the presence of a preacher named Fanny LaRue. She was 90 years old back in the early 1980s. She was, her grandmother was a slave child, and she preached the gospel in a way that took this sinner boy and just plastered him against that wall. So that song just reminded me of Fanny LaRue, 90 years old, with more energy than I ever had in my life. So praise God, rest her soul, I'm, and uh, I thank God for the message of Fanny LaRue. And an old Southern Baptist Church, right, Pastor? Hallelujah. Okay, I won't go that quite far out. I don't think you're ready for that yet. <laughs> But I will read from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses um, 36 uh, uh, through 38. These are the words recorded for us. These are the words that Jesus spoke. They are recorded for us. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and sews it on an old garment. Otherwise, the new will be torn and the peace from the new will not match the old. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the new skin will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins, and no one, after drinking old wine, desires the new wine, but says, the old is good. May God add his blessing to this reading and give us understanding into his holy wisdom. Thank you, Clint. And thank you, choir. All right. And that will sort of fit into some of my last remarks this morning. Pentecostal power. Pentecostal power. Amen. Amen. So today we continue our series of messages that I started a couple weeks ago. This is now number three on the parables of Jesus. Jesus was a great teacher, recognized then as well as down through the years, the history, even of other faiths, that he was a great teacher, a great teacher of truth. And he used parables to explain, to make clear the truth, the principles that he was sharing. <clears throat> Today we are dealing with Two small or shorter parables, the new cloth on an old garment and new wine in old wineskins. Some of these shorter parables, for sure, and they are found together in two of the three synoptic gospels, Matthew and Luke. Somewhat different details, but um, making the same point. Jesus used these parables to explain and make clear truths that he was attempting to teach to his disciples and other people who were hearing or listening, to explain, to make clear biblical truths. Parables, earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. Let's look at these uh, two short parables and what did they state? I should read, first of all, Matthew's account goes along with Luke's description of the parables. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making a tear worse. Neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst and the wine will ruin out, and the wineskin will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. That's Matthew's account of the parables. Now, <clears throat> the first of these parables involves the mending of an old garment, and the second, 
tells us about how to contain new wine, how to preserve it. So number one, the old coat or garment being repaired. Now Jesus said it doesn't make sense to rip a piece of cloth from something new and sew it onto something old. Now, this whole story about mending garments, I can definitely identify with growing up in the not quite as prosperous times of the 1950s, the youngest child experiencing hand-me-downs, torn jeans, etc. Back in the day, back in the day, my mother, who was an accomplished seamstress on her own, made a lot of her own dresses and my sister's dresses as well. She would buy material, thread, patterns, and I can see her laying these things out there on the uh, table and then uh, cutting and then sewing them. Uh, my sister learned how to, actually my sister made Deb's wedding dress. By that. So my mother did a lot of sewing, not only for herself, but uh, repairing the clothing of the family things that still had some use for wearing around the farm. Not, sun, not your Sunday best, you understand. Anybody remember or identify with, with all this? Yeah. Now, in those days, that was a little different than today. Today, people wear or even buy torn jeans in particular and jackets. It's almost a status symbol. They buy them this way. Now, I call these things designer rips. Designer rips. And you have to wonder how they get that way. Do they have some little people somewhere in some storage room or share place tearing holes in the knees and other places and then throwing them into a barrel of rocks that churns and, you know, get that stone washed effect, you know? Uh, or maybe they just... Uh, go around to second-hand shops and buy up used clothing and uh, resell it. I don't know. But you, you go to stores, and uh, my, my one day I was with my daughter. I took her to buy a jacket, and she ended up doing some other shopping while she was there. And uh, it was a pair of jeans with the ripped knees, you know? That's how they, that's how they were being sold. And that's what they were being bought. Designer rips is what I call that. Okay. Well, back in the day, and my parents lived through the Depression, so um, people did wear old uh, but mended clothing. Uh, they didn't go around with rips. Now, maybe a few hobos. Remember hobos? Hobos, guys hitchhiking on the uh, trains and all that. Maybe hobos did, but uh, people would mend the torn jeans or clothing items. They were mended so they could be repaired and continued to be worn uh, out of necessity not to make a fashion statement, you understand. My mother would say, by the way, that uh, wearing something mended, there was no shame in that. She did draw a line on wearing something that was dirty. She didn't think that was good. She said, you know, everybody can afford to wash something. It just takes a little water and a little soap. And uh, I heard that thing about cleanliness is next to godliness so much, I thought for sure it was a biblical quote, biblical reference. <clears throat> Back in that day, we had an old, it was, it was new then, ringer washer. Remember those ringer washers? Okay, you want to get your hands in, in those things. But uh, after she washed things, she would then hang them up out on the line to dry. Uh, that was our uh, green way of doing things back in the day before the green movement, right? And, you know, it was kind of nice uh, wearing clothing that hung out on a line to dry the sun, the air, fresh air. And especially if the neighbor just mowed, just mowed hay, that fresh mowed hay smell. Not so good if the neighbor spread some manure. That, that wasn't so good. That wasn't so good. So my mother, she served and she sewed and she mended everyday clothes, things that we continued to wear around the farm, 
not something we'd wear to church or go to school or the trips in a town that we've made periodically to shop. So my mother mended and sewed and repaired jeans, shirts, jackets, and uh, she used material salvaged from other old clothing items. She had this rag basket of items of different stages of uh, repair and wear. Uh, and so she would attempt to match a patch to whatever she was uh, sewing. She had this rag basket. And eventually the stuff that really didn't get used was picked up by the rag man. Rag man used to come around, you remember? Pick up rags. Okay. So Jesus gives us a couple reasons in these parables about uh, how to mend and how not to mend things. Number one, he says, you wouldn't tear or cut material from a new garment to sew onto an old garment because that wouldn't make sense. You would be ruining the new garment uh, to fix something old. Wouldn't make any sense in ruining something new to save something old. Secondly, the new patch, if it was something new, wouldn't match the old garment. So it would be very, uh, you know, identifiably different. You would attempt, as my mother did, to find something that was a, a similar color and, and wear to match what was being repaired. Less obvious having that kind of a match or a patch on a pair of jeans or a coat, shirt, etc. And then the third reason, practical reason that he gives here, is that uh, the new material uh, that wasn't washed or wasn't shrunk, if it was sewed onto an old garment to fix a hole or a tear, it'd be okay until you washed it. And then when you washed it, it would shrink. And as it shrink, it would pull away from what was patched or repaired, the tear. And you would be back having a tear again. So those are the three reasons that Jesus gives in this parable about uh, repairing old garment, new and the old, and the wisdom behind what he said of how to do it and how not to do it. The second parable, maybe less familiar to us here in the uh, 20 and 21st century in North America, uh, involves uh, making wine and making wine from Grapes and, of course, uh, juice that uh, was squeezed from the grapes and then put into some kind of containers. Now, we today use barrels to put the wine and let the wine season for a time to ferment, etc. Stored for a time in a, in a wine cellar uh, before use or sale. Well, 2,000 years ago, things were a little different in the Middle East. And maybe in some of those cultures today out there in Mongolia and whatever else, where nomadic people live uh, and they don't have maybe the things that are accessible to those of us here in the, in the developed West. And so they would use uh, animal skins turned inside out and then uh, sewed up uh, to make it um, an item that could contain the wine. Sewed up, closed up, and used to contain the wine, or to carry or store it. So, you know, the animals and these nomadic people, uh, they would use every, like the North American Indians, they would use every bit of, of an animal. Uh, the skins, they'd eat the meat, uh, the ligaments and all that stuff would be what they would use to sew. Uh, so, uh, they were very practical about that. Very ingenious and developed over centuries and uh, passed down by these nomadic people. So he says, Jesus says, nobody puts new wine into old or used wine animal skins because the wine, as it's fermenting, expands. And the old skins that had lost their elasticity uh, would burst as the new wine would ferment and expand. So that wouldn't be good. Instead of containing the wine, the wine skins would burst and you would leak or lose the new wine. So the new wine was always put into new wine skins. 
Older wineskins would be used to carry water, which uh, you wouldn't be subject to change like fermenting of, uh, of wine. Now, these parables were used by Jesus to explain to his hearers some truths. What is the takeaway of this uh, new patch on old garments, new wine, and the old wineskins? What's the takeaway for us today? Well, you have to, first of all, look at the context. Look at the context of why Jesus told these parables. And if you have a reference Bible, it perhaps is entitled the paragraph, Jesus questioned about fasting. Jesus questioned about fasting. So Jesus was questioned about fasting, and he told these parables to explain um, his view about fasting and why his disciples weren't currently fasting like the disciples of John. And some of Jesus' disciples, you remember, were actually, uh, had been disciples of John the Baptist. Context is always important. Now, as you know, I'm trained in history, and uh, how do you understand events in history is the context. I'll give you an example. January the 6th, which was a horrible day in America, didn't happen in a vacuum. It happened after nine months of riots in dozens of cities where there was riots and lootings and loss of life and property, attacks on police stations and at federal courthouses. It was during the pandemic. And then you got some people that obviously did some very bad things on January the 6th. So that's the context. How do you understand history? You got to understand history in the sense of context. And how do you interpret theology? You have to understand it also in context. And the context of these parables is Jesus being questioned about fasting. John's disciples, people ask him, they fast. How is it that, uh, the Pharisees said, your disciples do not fast? Especially since some of his disciples, like John, had been disciples of John the Baptist. Jesus answered and said this, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and then they will fast. So that's the context. Jesus teaching about fasting. Now let me get back to my notes here. Um, this setting is talking about fasting. Jesus used these parables about the new and the old to teach about the guests of the bridegroom. He says, don't fast when they're in the presence of the bridegroom, but they fast when the bridegroom is taken or is absent from them. Luke chapter 6, verse 34, and the passage I just read here, Matthew 9, 15. Jesus is the bridegroom. And his followers, us, we are the bride of church, the bride of Christ, the church. So the setting of these parables, the reason that Jesus used these two parables, the old and the new, the theological explanation of this, the practical truths for these realities, well, involves fasting. So you might say, uh, well, what's the point today, preacher, about uh, fasting? What are the practical implications mentioned about the new and the old here and about fasting? Well, the bridegroom was present at the time. And so he's saying, his followers, they weren't going to fast because they're in the presence of the bridegroom. And, of course, there was a party. Like, there was, there was a party yesterday up in the northern part of the state. We were celebrating a certain person here, James, who turned 70, 70th birthday party. So welcome to that generation of us in the 70s, all right? It's, it's life after 70. It really is, all right? That was a good party. So, uh, yes, there was a little bit of uh, no fasting going on yesterday. No, 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 some very good food and drink. Okay. So, a bridegroom, when he's present, and the bride, there's a, there's a party, there's a reception. But, he says, uh, when the bridegroom is not there, the bridegroom is taken away. That's uh, 
a period of mourning or loss of absence, that's when it would be appropriate to fast. Since Jesus was present, he's saying that's why my disciples are not fasting. I'm present. But there could come a time when he would be taken from them and uh, fasting uh, and prayer would be uh, something that is part of the followers of Jesus Christ then. Now, fasting uh, is not all that popular in the modern age, is it? Now, there are some benefits of fasting, uh, additionally, uh, as well as spiritually. One is when we're during late, like Lent, people are a little bit more spiritually minded, maybe during times of uh, intense prayer, uh, you're praying and you're really just not hungry. And you're very involved in prayer. And so, you know, that's certainly one of the times why you often see in the New Testament prayer and fasting uh, mentioned together. And actually, in the, some of the older manuscripts, when they would be recopied and, and uh, passed along, some of the people who did this, it was monks. And some of the people that today fast, of course, people in monasteries, etc. So sometimes... In some of the newer translations, you might just see prayer where some of the older manuscripts, which are actually newer than the manuscripts used by the newer translators, that confuse everybody. Um, if you see something in an older manuscript that's not in the newer ones, you'd have to then say, well, maybe it was added. And so sometimes some of the monks would, uh, because they were looking at similar passages, they said prayer, they would say prayer and fasting. And in some cases, it's, they're both mentioned that way. Prayer and fasting, definitely there's a connection. There's also some other good reasons for fasting. Um, for instance, uh, when I'm out working in a garden, I don't know about you, Mary Claire, but when I'm out working in a garden, Linda, I'm out working in a garden, I, I just like work right through lunch, and I'm not hungry. Got to watch out, though, come 10 o'clock at night if you're sitting there watching TV. That uh, snack, all those snacks that are out there calling to you. So, so But uh, I tend to, uh, on Mondays, do that. I tend to sort of skip uh, lunch on Mondays. Uh, it's also uh, good for the waistline. If you did a little overeating over the weekend, uh, have a day where you eat less or fast. Good thing. There's some health reasons. For fasting, and there's certainly, as I mentioned, some spiritual reasons for fasting. So, give it a thought, give it a try. So, here at um, WBCC, uh, we've had some um, reasons to um, consider these things about the new and the old, have we not? Here's some examples: the new and the old. We rebuilt the ladies' restroom a couple years back, and to do so. We gutted the whole area and actually expanded some into the living room back here. And then we uh, rebuilt this very nice, very modern ladies' room with 1,500-some tiles that uh, Tim did in the floor and all of that. Nothing old was utilized. The old was gutted out, and it's all new. Bless you. All right. Um, now, uh, the second big project was rejuvenating, that was the word, Paulie, rejuvenating the sanctuary. So as they were tearing off that, that old paneling that was here, it had seen better days, uh, they discovered this bee board that's now white, but it was dark brown. And the bee board went up and up. And um, when you go around to some of these older houses down here, your sister's house, that was the material 100, 125 years ago. Bee board, that stuff's about that thick. Very hard wood. I don't know what kind of wood it was, but chestnut or something. It was very hard wood with the, you know, the grooves in it. So uh, I got a phone call when they were tearing off the paneling here from Mary Claire. I said, Pastor Kent, guess what we discovered? You go down and see, guess what we discovered underneath this paneling? Discovered this bee board. So what do we did? We took all that paneling off, and we sanded it down, and we filled in some spots, and uh, Uncle Bill back here made a tool to put some grooves into the new board, and Greg and the rest uh, put hands to it and, and 
sanded and then they painted it and filled in spots. And so we, we saved and incorporated the old with the new, along with all the uh, new wood trim and whatever else. And so uh, we rejuvenated this 1895 chapel. And I think it actually came out looking like a very New England congregational little church, right? Little white church. Uh, so there's some new and old here. Uh, we didn't go the whole way up with our things, but we got rid of that um, paneling. And I guess, you know, back in the day, in the 50s or the 1960s, anybody here around 1950 and 1960 when that was done? Lee, Cliff, Link, anybody uh, remember what it, when that was done? It was, I'm sure because it was all that dark, it was very dark in here. So they wanted to lighten things up, brighten things up. So that was the effort to, uh, with the uh, paneling and the drywall and the paint and all that. So when we rejuvenated the sanctuary, there's some new and some old in here. But uh, moving on to uh, the next uh, project here was the ramp out front. Uh, a ramp had been there some time to accommodate, you know, people with some movement issues. Uh, and uh, the ramp was there for a good number of years. But it, it started to see nails upon nails and screws, and it was being held. And so finally, you know, uh, the thought was, we need to replace we need to replace the boards on the ramp. So, Greg he crawls underneath, and uh, he discovers it uh, structurally uh, not so good. There was some, some centerpiece there missing, and all that. And the, the idea was that uh, it, it had a, it had to go. The whole thing had to go. It really just had seen its use in better days. And so a lot of research into what kind of boards to use down here near the uh, salt water and whatever else. And so uh, after we got the, the ramp built, very first guy, Karen's uh, brother did uh, a lot of the, work, the carpentry work, but a whole lot of people were involved in ordering and buying the materials and figuring out what was needed. And then, uh, well, we need it. We need a, a railing. We need a rail. So that was the second part of the project was the railing. And that ended up costing us just about as much probably as the, the ramp, right, Paula? But we got a fine ramp out there now. It's all new. It's really old. It's been replaced. And it's gonna, probably going to be there long past us. And uh, when Jesus comes back, it might still be there. So that's all new. We got, we got another project. And men, I think uh, the trustees are getting ready to talk about the men's room there in the back. And uh, how to uh, repair and replace or rejuvenate that whole part of the building uh, and bring it into the 21st century. So, something new. The new versus the old. We've had some experience of all that here at Wilderman Beach, have we not? But there's a, uh, another theological explanation, kind of like what I mentioned around the context of Jesus being asked about why his disciples didn't fast, and he was telling the story about the bridegroom. Theological explanation about the, the new and the old. I think certainly would include, and that song today the choir sang, fit very much into what we're talking about now, is Pentecost. What happened at Pentecost? Pentecost involved something new. The coming of the Spirit in power indwelling the believers. Now, the Holy Spirit of God and God of Spirit was obviously always present in the world and operating, but under the Old Testament economy of things, the Spirit would come upon people. You remember the story about Samson? And sometimes uh, people would lose the Spirit. The Spirit would come upon Elijah and enable him and Elisha to do the things that that um, they did. Uh, David prayed, Lord, don't take your spirit from me. Uh, not something that Christians today would, would need to pray. We'd want to keep up the fullness of the spirit. But uh, the New Testament period that we're now in, age of the church, is quite different from the Old Testament economy of things. As the spirit came at Pentecost and filled the believers, and in a sense, it burst the new burst the old. The new burst the old. What was the old? The laws and the religion, the rituals of the Old Testament cult of religion of Judaism. Something new had emerged, the spirit indwelling the church in great power 
and transforming people like Peter who had denied the Lord, denied the Lord three times, and then standing up and delivering a powerful sermon of Pentecost that led 3,000 people to confess their faith in Christ as Lord. The church is something that is new. And it's new, the people of God today, because of something that took place at Pentecost. We are now living in the last of the last days, but the last days, according to Acts chapter 2, actually began at Pentecost. And there's a quote in Acts chapter 2 that's from the prophet Joel. It says this, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions and old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. They will show, show wonders in heaven. I will show wonders in heaven and above. And signs on the earth below. And blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will turn into darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so the prophet Joel foresaw the coming of the Spirit in power and in dwelling the believers in the church on Pentecost. Prophet Joel had this description that is then quoted here by Peter as he addressed the choir. It's not rules and regulations and ritual, but Christianity is about a relationship, a relationship with God. And all who call upon the Lord, name of the Lord will be saved, saved from sin, sin that separates us from God, so that we can indeed have a relationship with God. Coming of the Holy Spirit in power changed Judaism to such an extent that a new faith emerged, Christianity, the church. Something new couldn't be contained in something old, like new wine and old wineskins. New wine would cause the old wineskins to burst. And Pentecost saw that take place as something new, the coming of the Spirit in dwelling and power, and it burst Judaism to such an extent that a new faith emerged, the church of Jesus Christ, because of the gospel shared and the Holy Spirit being present very powerfully in Peter's life and the other believers. Now, that not only happened at Pentecost, but down through the history of the church, down through the history of the church, and I cited one example Today, when I was talking about the Mennonites in Ukraine and the influence that came about as Baptist evangelists and the emergence of the Mennonite Brethren denomination, um, the emphasis and the focus on the Holy Spirit and the proclamation of the gospel. One of my seminary professors, by the way, was born in Ukraine, came as a child to Canada, and then uh, eventually uh, here in the United States teaching at my seminary before moving out west to the Mennonite Brethren Seminary, Dr. David Eward. The man was a, a giant among scholars. And uh, just, uh, I, I was, he was only there for the three years, but he was there the three years that I was there in seminary. And I, I discredit him for so much. What I learned about the scriptures and how to uh, study and interpret the scriptures. Mennonite Brethren came about as a result of a fresh wave of the Holy Spirit in that period, in the late 1800s, very early 1900s, in the Ukraine. Uh, down through the history of the church, the Protestant Reformation, 500 years ago, uh, Catholic priests like Martin Luther, uh, Menno Simons, who was uh, founder of the Mennonites, he was a, a Catholic priest as well. A new movement of the Spirit caused things to burst in religion, from people who were just, and sometimes things can just, the whole de denomination can degenerate into just lots of rules and regulations and, you know, yeah, tradition, tradition is good, but if it's lacking the life and the spirit of the spirit, 
It's just empty religion. It's not a vibrant relationship that we can know and have through Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I think that's a, a theological explanation about the new wine and old wineskins. The coming of the Spirit. Filling the believers, changing their lives, and changing a whole religion from one to a new faith. So the parable of the new patch on old, old garments and new wine into uh, wineskins, those are the practical as well as the theological explanations. I pray and trust that um, as you experience life, there are some times that we mend and preserve things, but there's a way to do that because it makes common sense and doesn't ignore the three things that Jesus said uh, should be considered. Uh, yes, you can get uh, some new life out of old garments, but at the same time, uh, there's the other teaching that new wine and old wineskins doesn't work. And what is needed is new wine and the new wineskins to preserve and to contain and carry on the wine and, in a sense, the work of the Spirit in our lives and in the life of the church. Let us pray. Lord, as we consider these two short parables about the new and the old, we can identify with these things here at the church as well as in our lives. We thank you for the newness of your spirit in our lives at some point in time, and we pray that that continues uh, as we uh, seek a fullness of your spirit to live in a relationship with you in ways that are pleasing and honoring, respectful of what is old and is going before, but open to and available now to the new work of the spirit in our lives. So we ask your blessing upon us as we think about, reconsider these teachings of these two little parables about our lives, the old and the new, the new and the old contrasted. Help us to get the message and apply it to our lives and share it with others. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 398 is our hymn before joys and concerns. 398 is cleanse me, cleanse me and refill me. Number 398.
Please be seated. Clint, joys and concerns. Well, thank you, Pastor, for uh, giving us a little insight into what the, uh, the parable of the wineskin is all about. So as we ponder this through the week, let the Spirit of God speak to you, bring to light some of that stuff. And I love the old stories about during the time of the Depression. I grew up, and probably you folks did too, with uh, your parents or grandparents that lived through the Great Depression. I lived in a farmhouse. I grew up in an old farmhouse with my grandmother. So, all those things you're saying, I can relate to. But I got one for you. Who can answer me this? What's a party line? <laughs> you know what a party line is? Okay. If I was talking to a different generation. They would say, I don't know, loud music? Yes. My grandmother used to answer the phone. I'll get to you. And so I got to tell the story. I love my grandmother. Old German woman. And I used to wonder why she did what she did. So the phone would ring. She would pick it up and hold it way out here. Hello? Yeah? Okay. I said, Grandma, why don't you just pick the phone up and say hello? Because in case somebody's talking on the other end. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, I grabbed the phone one time as a kid and picked it up into somebody talking. And I'm like, hey, somebody's talking on the phone. Put it down. <laughs> so, anyway, that was that. Anyhow. The new, God, and the, the new and the old. The new and the old, as it, they merge together. And I'm just a little kid, and I don't know what's going on. And she scared me about the refrigerator because it used to be an ice box. Close that door. I, she didn't know the motor would turn on and it would stay cold. She had to put the block of ice in. But anyway, glory to God. Um, at this time of joys and concerns, share uh, what's on your mind. This is a great time as a community. So... Let's see, Jim. Contrary to popular opinion, what Anthony announced a few weeks ago, I am actually going to be 70, not 73. <laughs> <laughs> Figured I'd set the record straight on that. Uh, I still have 10 days to go, though, so uh, I'm going to enjoy uh, the time before I get to the next zero year. But I, again, I, I want to thank this uh, congregation and, and everybody here that's part of it uh, for uh, helping me be who I am right now and uh, for uh, helping me celebrate uh, the upcoming 7 0, not 7 3. Well, happy birthday to you in 10 days. And uh, for Anthony, well, you know, he's going to just. Whatever Anthony needs to do, he's going to do, just to keep it lively. I love Anthony. Yes. I have two joys. One joy is my daughter got settled into her new place. Good. The other joy is next Sunday, Tom and I are going finally on the cruise. And it's. I found out that it's not only... For me, but because the reason why it's for me is because my family said when I turned 60, which I did, and then also it's for Lorna, which is my sister-in-law, because she turned 70. So we're finally going to go. Well, bless you on that. Have a good time. You'll be in our prayers. We'll miss you. But enjoy. Yes, Mary Claire. I had a conversation with Deb Murray this week. Um, she is still recuperating in a nursing home in Branford. Um, she was in the hospital again for several days. She had a severe UTI, but she is back in rehab, and she's determined to get herself home. So continued prayers for Debbie Murray. Thank you for sharing that. Kathy, how are you? Good. Good morning. This is just an update on um, BRM, Bridgeport Rescue. You know, we're still, we're still serving up to uh, between 150 and 170 people on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, you know, to come into the pantry. But on Tuesday now, between 2 and 3, we're going to be serving lunch to the community. Wow. So the community is going to be coming in on Tuesdays and Thursdays. 
between two and three for lunch. And no, Kathy will not be volunteering on Tuesdays and Thursdays as well as Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. <laughs> Tuesday is my day with my dad, and Thursday is just a Kathy day. You got to have a Kathy day. Uh, so, yeah, but, yeah. That's, but they haven't decided on dinner yet or supper, but um, two to three, Tuesdays and Thursdays. The cafeteria, the dining room will be open to the community. Okay, fantastic. Bridgeport Rescue Mission. You guys do a lot of, a lot of good work down there. Thank you so much. Oh, Al? Thanks, I just wanted to update you on my mother. Um, thanks all for praying for her. She's home. Good. She's recovering very well. Um, and she's got, right now she has the, um, we were talking about making arrangements for aftercare. And uh, that seems to be in place. So, uh, but I would continue to ask to pray, pray for her that uh, she continue right. to um, get the care that she needs and uh, be able to get out and, and uh, you know get get with people because that's what she needs right now. She needs to get out of that apart or that condo and start uh, resocializing again. So, um, I appreciate your support. She's right. doing much better. Thank good, you for your prayers. Good. Thanks for the update. Our prayers will be with her, and when she's ready, she wants me to come over and visit. Just give me a call. I'll stop by. Over here. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, just to want everybody to know to keep Anthony and his family in your prayers. Today's tomorrow's a big day for the family. Um, I saw on Facebook that R Raymond, the son, and uh, I forgot the daughter's name. Myra got married. Yes, Saturday. I guess it was Friday. And tomorrow is the day that she's going in. They're going to have the C-section to deliver mm -hmm. those three babies. So let's keep them all in our prayers. Yes, indeed. 11 o'clock? Okay. Oh, God bless them. And uh, oh, we'll look forward to seeing some new babies pretty soon. Fantastic. You know, your Bridgeport Rescue Mission, that's uh, so one time in a, a church I stopped in. Pastor had us do this. Right? So I'm thinking, boy, oh, one more? You're interrupting my story, but go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Yours is more important than mine. Well, uh, I just want to ask for prayer for, um, like, my family had a beach cottage. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, so uh, so they had a beach cottage. You know, they moved out this, la this last what was it, Saturday morning they moved out. But anyway, so Friday night I went over and we had lobsters on the beach. It was really beautiful. And um, so there's this newlywed couple that's going to get married, you know, and, and they're sitting with me. And um, so they went over, like, some in-law's house. Go, oh, you know, I was visiting. And the woman asked me, so have you given your life to Jesus yet? And she looked at her like, what are you, nuts? So, you know what? I'd like to pray for the two with them. You know, they're, they're just like in their early 30s. The world is still exciting. They, they haven't heard, you know what I mean? And it kind of, the whole mood of everything kind of like changed. And I'm like, I said, oh, did you get saved? And you know what I mean? You feel the feet under the, like, don't go there. It's like, but I'd like to pray for the two of them. Their um, names are Rich and Paige. So if you could keep them in your prayers that, they would find Jesus. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much. Clint, an update on Doreen. Doreen is I, um, doing much, much better. She's, uh, I was there last week. Uh, we had coffee together. I stopped and brought her coffee, and we just chatted about stuff. So she seems to be doing well. Uh, hopefully next week maybe she can uh, get back uh, to worship with us. Uh, it was a bumpy road, a little scary time even, um, but she's doing good. She's good. doing much better, and thank you all for your, your prayers. And, uh, you know, I say I hope we can see her next Sunday. So, but real quick, with this, with that, all that means is these are the hands of God in the human realm. We're doing God's work. If we don't do the work, it doesn't get done. Okay, he's called us to do that. He's called us. He's gifted us to do that. So whether your uh, ministry is in the Bridgeport Rescue Mission or witnessing to folks at a picnic or whatever it is, whatever the needs, these are our hand, these are God's hands in in the physical realm. 
It's our job. It's our duty. And um, so just remember that when you're out and about, no matter how great or how small the task may seem, uh, it's for God. It's for God. All right. Thank you very much. If we're all set, let's uh, just close. Uh, Pastor will close us out in prayer, and uh, we'll be done. Talking about the rescue mission, um, Larry Fullerton, who is retired from Black Rock Church, where he was one of the associate pastors. He was once a youth like those boys there over at Grace Baptist. I uh, knew his mom and dad very well. Uh, he's going to be a guest speaker that one of the Sundays that we're away. And uh, Kathy, uh, I sent word through her to him that we're a supporting church. We also sent one of our best uh, volunteers, so he needs to come and speak here again. He was here once at a time. <laughs> I delegate. I delegate. And the sister lives down here in Hauser, so uh, hopefully she can join us as well. Uh, so good to hear about Doreen. And uh, we pray that the NAFs have a safe return. Uh, David very faithfully started out down here with the live streaming, then back here. Then he trained two people so he could go away on vacation. And uh, Lisa getting a break as well. Uh, with uh, the uh, boys and Karen filling in with uh, helping with uh, the uh, children's classes as well. All right, let's pray. <coughs> Lord God, for these concerns that we shared and other things that are on people's hearts as well as just our general concern about our nation and world situation in Ukraine, uh, we bring all these matters to, not to your attention because you know about these things, but you invite us to pray, even command us to pray, because when we pray, we're recognizing you as uh, someone who could actually do something about what we're asking. So we're expressing faith. And we always, uh, as we pray for these things, we, we trust that you, our Heavenly Father, know what is best and how to answer things that are we are concerned about or things that are on our hearts and minds. So we give these things to you. We pray for your will to be done. And now we close this time of prayer by praying the way Jesus taught us to pray, by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our transgressions, as we forgive those who have transgressed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for now and forever. Amen and amen. And now our parting hymn, number 394, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. Number 394.
come up and do something with this chorus? This really puts you on the spot? All right, I, I think you could do it. All right? Spirit just said, ask Joanne to come up. Okay. Spirit moved. All right. She knows this song. My feeble life is o'er. Thank you, Joanne, for volunteering Army style. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, last week we had the garden party. We even sang the song, The Garden Party. But I know some people were away and uh, had other things going on. So, the garden party goes on this afternoon again from 2 to 4 over at 182 Forest Road. You can see the successes of my garden, and you can see some issues and challenges that uh, I'm dealing with. But uh, Mrs. Fellenbaum's famous mint tea is available. So if you are free this afternoon, you want to drop in from 2 to 4, we'll be there. Uh, you don't have to pull any weeds, but you can come enjoy the shade and some tea. And if you can't make it today, let me know some other time we can work this out. So uh, tomatoes are starting to color up the little ones anyway, the salad tomatoes. And uh, the cucumbers are getting nice and big. We've been eating lettuce and peas. So uh, garden, we're in, that, we're in that time and starting to replant stuff for the second crops. Uh, uh, so that works as well. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon our rest of the day and this week. Pray that we might indeed be a blessing, especially sharing faith and hope to others this week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.